And it's my great pleasure to, and honor to um, share with you my work. So uh, let me start out with this data. Okay. So can you guess what this is about? <laughs> Yes, yeah, this is the um, average uh, house prices in 2015 in major Canadian cities. So as you can see, uh, Vancouver is at the top and actually a uh, detached house uh, in Vancouver now averages 1.78 billion dollars, million dollars, sorry, million dollars. And this um, has to do with the offshore Invest, investment. So um, this has been a big topic of public discussion <laughs> and I found um, this recent radio documentary. I'm not sure this is a um, uh, TV documentary as well. Has anybody seen this? No? Maybe this was just um, a radio documentary but um, it's titled Race and real estate, Vancouver's China syndrome. Um, I thought this was very interesting, so I will uh, play some excerpts from this radio documentary. <coughs> David Eby, the NDP housing critic in British Columbia, called an emergency town hall meeting in Vancouver earlier this spring to talk about that city's out-of-control real estate market. First, he booked a 150-seat hall. Well, the seats were gone in an instant. Then, a 300-seat venue. Finally, a hall that could seat 700. And still, there was a waiting list. 700 people showed up fit to be tied because there are no houses they can afford, because there are no apartments to rent. 700 people upset because their children have been priced out of the market. A detached house in Vancouver now averages $1.78 million. The people at that meeting blamed the provincial government. They hurled epithets at real estate agents. But underneath there was a smoldering resentment of the growing number of millionaire immigrants and offshore investors from China buying up property in the Lower Mainland. The Vancouver real estate boom has captured media attention all over the world. At home, it has given rise to ugly accusations and very difficult conversations. Here is Karen Wells' documentary, Race and Real Estate, Vancouver's China Syndrome. I've never... <laughs> kind, of, kind of things. To them, Vancouver's at the bank. I have two small kids, it's my younger child, is sleeping in my master bathroom. My husband and I both have PhDs. My husband is an immigrant. It has been remarkable to me how many times I have been dissuaded from talking about how hard it is to live here because of fear of being labeled a racist. I will not be told that the city I care about so much I cannot complain about for fear of being called a racist. I can look across the I'll buy it. And that's something people aren't used to. People are fearful just like it was before the Second World War or the Yellow Peril, right? It, it's still there. Fear of the Yellow Peril and blaming the Chinese has a long history in Canada. Bing Tom's grandfather paid the head tax when he came. His father qualified as a pharmacist in BC but was never allowed to practice because he was Chinese. He left for Hong Kong in disgust, and years later put his wife and children on a boat back to Vancouver and said, you try. Three months ago I was at street corner. Uh, I stopped my car, the other person stopped their car. We both kind of had this tit for two, and the person jumped out of his car and said to me, why don't you go back to where you came from? I'm third generation here, I have the Order of Canada, I have the Golden Medal of Architecture. I still get that. Still? Still. There's a lot of it isn't said, but a lot of it is said in the living rooms and the whatever. But there's no doubt about it. There's a lot of fear. It, it's still there. But the fact of the matter, it's a class problem. It's not a race problem. And it's just something we have to get used to. So 
if you're interested, um, you can uh, get online and listen to the whole story. Okay. Um, but um, this story um, resonates uh, with my own experiences and um, it um, makes us um, ask this question, how can we as anti-racist teachers position ourselves in this conflict of views and realities? Um, very difficult um, interracial um, conflicts and um, issues um, which are also related to uh, political economy, the class issues, and so forth. So, um, and I have to tell you, um, the last um, story of this third generation Chinese Canadian man um, really uh, resonates with my own experience. Three days ago, I came back from uh, Singapore and uh, from Vancouver airport to my home, I took a taxi and the taxi driver was a black person. And as we approached to the destination, my um, home on UBC campus actually, um, he started to ask questions like, um, how long have you lived here? Uh, do you like it here? Uh, he said, I used to live in one of those um, condos, and, but I moved to uh, Richmond and I now live um, with my um in a neighborhood um, where there are lots of Chinese uh, people. And I feel very comfortable living in Richmond because these Chinese people don't bother me and you know we live very peacefully. And then um, after we arrived at my um, uh, residence, um, it's actually a town home. Um, four stories, so I live on the upper unit and um, and there is a uh, resident at, uh, um, beneath me, right? Okay. And as we um, arrived in the destination, um, I really um, got very frustrated about my recent experience of being accused for making loud noise by my neighbor downstairs. And I had received a letter from Strata Council uh, just before I left my Singapore trip saying that I um, should pay $200 fine for making loud noise, which I didn't make, right? So um, I shared that story with uh, the taxi driver. And then we got into this um, conversation for the next 20 minutes <laughs> in the car, um, which never happened be uh, to me before to have a conversation with a taxi driver after arriving in the destination. But anyway, he said, um, I grew up um, in Quebec. I'm a native speaker of French, and um, I speak English with an accent, and I Sometimes I um, get this comment from some people here, um, go back to where you are from, uh, the same kind of comment that uh, this uh, Chinese Canadian person gets. And then he said, um, people in Western Canada are very arrogant. Um, they don't welcome us like me and Chinese people and like you. and. Um, he um, gave me some advice, um, but it was really an um, interesting experience. Um, so that really makes me think that um, these experiences are real, actually, right? So anyway, um, moving to Vancouver, April 2012. This is a picture I took um, at the Vancouver Convention Center. How many of you have been to Vancouver Convention Center? Oh, many of you. Um, so this is a beautiful location, as you all know. So I will share with you um, my story, okay? So I hope this works, okay? So it was around um, 7.30 p.m. On the second day of ARA conference, it's American Educational Research Association conference, 
um, held at Vancouver Convention Center. I stepped out of the humongous venue located at the edge of Vancouver Harbor. I had ex escaped to catch a bus home from a packed room where interesting questions about racialization were posed by the audience. Outside, I was taken aback by the beauty of the sunlight illuminating North Vancouver across the water. Without the large crowd seen earlier in the day, it was a perfect scene for a photo. I took out my camera and started taking photos. Two young white men passed by me. Suddenly, a voice was thrown at me. Chinese tourist. It came from one of the men who was obviously drunk. I turned to them and asked, what are you doing here? Are you just visiting? The intoxicated man muttered, oh, were you born here? Are you Canadian? The other guy, uh, less drunken guy spoke on behalf of his friend. I apologize for my friend if you are Canadian. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. Um, Racism um, had been on my mind academically and professionally. A colloquium on race and language learning in Multicultural Canada, which I um, organized, was scheduled for the fourth day of the conference. By the way, um, this uh, colloquium uh, was turned into a special issue for the Journal of Multilingual and Multicultural Development, published last year, so if you're interested, please take a look. Okay. And I was supposed to co-present and later co-publish a paper with a graduate student on the past, present continuity of racism observed um, in the exclusion of Chinese immigrant students from educated opportunities in public schools in Metro Vancouver. Specifically, um, in this paper, we wanted to focus on a newly proposed Mandarin immersion program in Vancouver um, and critically analyze the public discourse um, supporting the exclusion of Mandarin speaking immigrant students who were English language learners um, from this proposed program. The reason was um, these students um, need to learn English. They don't need to um, learn Mandarin. Um, the priority should be um, learning English. But this paper had just been put under scrutiny by someone at my university who didn't want to go to public for political and ideological reasons. It's quite okay to talk about language ideology to analyze this exclusion, but linking it to racism is inflammatory and positions teachers, administrators, and parents as racist. So the uh, criticism, criticism goes. So I asked him, what do you do? I work at school. He replied, oh, what do you do at school? I clean. I'm a janitor. See, your expression changed from smiling to this. He made a frowning face. I denied his um, assertion, but ruling out that possibility entirely would be too pretentious. Or that expression was what he desired to see a wealthy Asian Canadian looking down upon a working class white man. I asked bluntly if he didn't want to see too many Asian people in Canada. We have a big disparity, he said. Uh, two thirds of the people are in debt and one third dominate our economy. When a job opens up, it goes to Asians, East Indians, or someone handicapped. Last week, a black woman took our job. While the conversation was going on, his friend uh, increasingly became restless and started to make noises. Were you born here? Are you Canadian? Were the questions asked more than twice, but I refused to answer. I was born in Japan 
and I'm not Canadian, but does it really matter? Finally, he asked, what's your name? That was probably his last resort to find out where I was really from. I still resisted and asked, what's your name? Um, after finally exchanging our names, he had to take care of his friend. I took off my glove for handshaking. He said, I appreciate you taking off your glove. Was he still going to construct me as an immigrant Asian snob without the uh, proper white Canadian manners? My physical appearance constructed me as a Chinese tourist in the first place. The fact that I spoke English created a possibility that I might be a Canadian citizen. But my Asianness, the way I dressed um, in a conference attire, and a foreign sounding name perhaps conjured up an image of wealthy, educated immigrant um, non citizen who would take jobs away from working class white Canadians. So that's my um, experience. And um, this um, experience um, really uh, made me um, aware of my own uh, socioeconomic privilege in Vancouver, and also my positioning in, um, as a, a, set, a settler of color in the um, larger uh, relations of power among uh, people uh, from different uh, background. So um, in this talk, I'm going to um, address issues of uh, decolonizing anti-racism, de-essentializing anti-racism, de-simplifying anti-racism, de-silencing anti-racism. And altogether, I would like to advocate for critical anti-racism. Okay? So I'm going to talk about um, each one of those components. <clears throat> 